The Committee on the Academy and Profession also created a new chair school in 2003, and then in 2005, they imagined this Martin Meyerson Award for Distinguished Leadership in Higher Education. They had the idea that it was important to showcase administrative successes. It was important uh, to, to celebrate examples. Um, and it was important to show the way in which the Planning Academy punches above its weight in administration in higher education. And that's never been truer than it is today, but it, it was true back in 2005 as well. Today's honoree is a wonderful example of punching above his weight, our weight, uh, in higher administration in universities. He has served in administrative capacities at four institutions, some of that during very difficult times, as you know very well, difficult financially, politically, and with the unprecedented pandemic that we've lived through. Um, he is credited with having turned around his college at Illinois, re rebounding enrollments and setting finances on a rational course with a radically different budget model. His Vision 2030 initiative led to the most diverse recruited class in, the, in Oregon State University's history. He stimulated OSU's first graduate education strategic plan. He transformed leadership development with a landmark Provost's Fellows program. He served on the executive committee of the Association of Public and Land-Grant Colleges. And most importantly, he has been a member of ACSP's committee on the academy. Um, please join me in congratulating Ed Fazer of Oregon State, recipient of the Martin Meyerson Award for Distinguished Leadership in Higher Education. Ed, we have a, uh, a, a lovely trophy for you. All right, thank you. And look, and look this way. Okay. All right, thank you. Appreciate it. Well, thank you very much. Uh, they promised me I could talk about the state of higher education. That's a dangerous topic. Uh, once I get going, it's hard to stop. But I want to say first, thank you very much for this, for this award. It, it caught me completely by surprise. I got a text from Bruce that he needed to talk. And I thought, this is probably for a reference or something for somebody, which is often how I uh, end up reconnecting with people. And this, this was just a, a total pleasant surprise. And, especially because I think the nomination probably required some careful revisionist history on various decisions I've made over the years. Uh, and apparently it was a collaboration of folks at Illinois and Oregon State, which is really nice to, to see that as well. But I've also, it's, it's really humbling be, to join some of the other people who've been recognized, Bruce among them, uh, Jennifer Cowley, uh, 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 Chris Silver, uh, Jay Chatterjee, Linda Dalton, and, and some others. So it, it just, uh, it's really, it's really um, uh, wonderful to, to accept this award. Um, so I wanna talk, I was asked, would I talk about the state of uh, the university and implications for urban planning programs? So I'll offer you some thoughts along those lines and maybe talk a little bit about political polarization as well. Can you hear me okay? Okay, good. Um, let me ask you this first though. If you're an administrator, raise your hand. All right, that's good. Admitting it is the first step toward recovery. <laughs> that joke among administrators always gets a chuckle, and you kind of wonder why. And I think, you know, it, we have a long tradition in higher ed, as you know, of uh, this model uh, of service being something that we should not aspire to do or administration being something we should not aspire to do. And I think there's some positives to that. We should remind ourselves we got into this business to be scholars and teachers. That's why I think every one of us in this room were motivated to, uh, to go into this field. Um, so that's a positive. But the negative is we've not been very good among, among universities, and Bruce alluded to it, uh, in supporting in a deliberate way academic leadership. And that's to the detriment of our institutions. And it's, it's particularly problematic right now in higher ed, uh, where the rate of change has really accelerated for a variety of reasons that I'll talk about. 
So good for you for taking these roles on. They're among the most difficult in the university. I think it was the most difficult job I had, had uh, among the different roles I've had because you are right on the front lines of engaging your faculty and attempting to drive the kind of change that needs to happen for our institutions, for our program, this discipline, and for our institutions to thrive. It's not an easy job. I positively hated it for the first two years that I served as a department head. Uh, and warmed up to it for the next two years. Dean was the best job, by the way, so if you can uh, move up one level. Provost, I do not recommend as a general <laughs> rule. Most people, when they come to see me and say, I want to be a provost, I say, why? Um, so let me talk about um, some, uh, what I think are, you know, I don't want to say disruptors because it's an overused term, but some um, of the factors that we're facing in higher ed. My big message here for you, for those of you in the department head role, um, is it's really important to think outside in and then inside out. And what I mean by that is think about the university first and understand the context that the university is operating first. And then think about your department within that context. We tend to think inside out first. And I think that leads uh, unit leaders at all levels down uh, paths that maybe don't open up as much opportunity uh, for them uh, as it would if they began by thinking with a very wide lens. So I think one of the things that I've learned over the years as a department head and a dean and a, a division head and a provost, et cetera, um, is how important it is that you think about the sector, the institution, the sector, and the trends that are driving the institution's success. So let me talk about a few of those. First of those, among those, demographic change. You know about this. You know about it uh, in a very, uh, for many of you, I think a very um, significant way, but slowing uh, traditional enrollment across the university. And it's not just within professional programs like planning. It's all across higher education uh, right now. College going rates are going to remain static without substantial increases in investment to increase those rates. That's a simple reality. College going rates in the United States actually stabilized around 2004. And they haven't really changed in a significant way since then. And the population groups that are going, growing relatively faster today are those who have lower college going rates. And I'll talk about why that's important uh, in just a minute. So en enrollment growth is slowing broadly across the United States. Uh, we're in a period of slowing growth, but it's very regionally diverse, very demographically diverse, and that turns out to have a big impact on many of your programs. Some of you in the fast-growing states absorbing growth uh, and seeing increases, and in, in many of you, probably majority, seeing soft enrollment, not just in your programs, but at your universities. And because of the amount of cross-subsidy within the university, that's why you have to care about that overall university position. There's tremendous demand for education among non-traditional students, and we need to pay more attention to tapping it. There are about 18 million college students in the United States. There are about 36 million people with some college and no degree that represent an opportunity. I think they represent an opportunity, perhaps for a field like this, more so than some others. Uh, in terms of reaching out and getting those students to complete and perhaps going on to a master's degree. You hear a lot about the demographic cliff. It's coming, but I want to make you feel just slightly better about it if, you're, if it's keeping you up at night. If you think about the baby boom example, uh, births peaked in 1957. High school graduates, as you would expect, started to fall in 1975. But the rate of college going increased. Uh, universities improved financial aid. They established branch campuses to reach out more to adult learners. Uh, they recruited international students. Graduate students grew, grew at a very high rate. And for many of us here, we saw those rates of growth in our programs at the time we were coming up in the field. From 1986 to 2020, graduate education grew substantially uh, across the United States. Um, my big message here is universities are resourceful. And so I'm less panicked about the enrollment cliff than you'll read in the, the media. Um, today, and to give you some additional context, the prediction is that we peak uh, high school graduates at three and a half million in 2025, or 26, depending on the data source you look at, and it falls to 3.2 million in 2030. Well, we were at 3.2 million in 2015. 
So we weren't that, we're not gonna be that far off from where we were fairly recently. The problem, as I said, is, is really regional. If you're in Florida and Arizona and Texas and so on, you're, you're uh, seeing a lot of growth. That doesn't help you if you're in Michigan or Illinois or uh, Nebraska, uh, where given that students tend to go uh, more closely. Now you'd say, why am I talking this much about undergraduate enrollment? Because it is the fundamental driver of the budget of your universities, almost everywhere. It is the principal dollar source. At Oregon State, seven out of ten dollars coming from undergraduate tuition in our flexible education and general fund budget. So uh, the, the message here, and uh, our enrollment management guy, John Bockenstadt, if you follow any of his work, he's got a pretty big following in the US in enrollment management. He just had an article in the Chronicle of Higher Ed. He basically says, uh, plan for the worst, do everything you can to realize the best. Don't hope for the best. And that's another underlying theme I want to uh, uh, emphasize today, which is we need to change. And that's not going to be easy. Um, second trend, external factor, um, strained financial model. Tuition is, they're at their limits. We can't increase tuition if we wanted to. The market, for most of us, isn't going to sustain increased tuition rates. Uh, of course, there are lots of reasons not to increase tuition, but fact is, market wouldn't bear it in most of our institutions. Universities have lost the narrative on public on, on debt. This is unfortunate because actually a certain amount of student debt is a sensible financial funding model, but we've really lost that narrative nationally, even though the majority of student debt is fairly well managed. Uh, but there are extreme cases that are capturing the public imagination. System finances in most of our states are a total mess. So they don't realize some of the things they're doing in two-year education that are undercutting the financial foundation of four-year education. They don't draw the connection between uh, credit for prior learning programs and traditional credit. They don't understand the implications of high school-based credit and how it's undercut the funding model of universities in one and two-year, which they use to cross-subsidize three and four-year. All of this is completely lost, and there's kind of a rush to trying to control cost escalation. That itself is a good idea, but there aren't very many system uh, sensible approaches across the U.S., and that's a challenge. Um, something coming your way, you're probably very aware of it in a big way, but it's coming university's way in a big way. Uh, our ability to fund the research enterprise is severely strained. If you're in an R1, um, this is a reality we're going to have to confront. We faced it at Oregon State. We faced it at Illinois when I was there. It was a quiet conversation. It's a hard one to have. But the reality is uh, university's response to this has been to add contingent faculty in large numbers. Most students now coming through for a PhD don't have the reasonable prospect of having or slotting into a tenure stream job. So asking them to do what many of us did as grad students, which is to spend a few years eating top ramen and getting paid a very low stipend so that we can then pay our dues and go on to a tenure stream appointment, many of those students are not looking at tenure stream appointments. They're looking at best at years of postdocs. So what you saw in the UC contract, if you followed the discussion around that labor contract, is what's coming, I think, across higher ed, which is a demand among graduate students and postdocs to get those trainee salaries up closer to a living wage. There is no financial model to pay for this. And I could tell you being on calls with uh, Pro Pac-12 Provost, uh, the UC folks, no idea how they're going to pay for this. Uh, but they've got, they've got to do it, and it's where graduate education is happening. So, you know, if you follow Holden Thorpe's writing on this, you uh, read his blog in Science that he wrote uh, back in February, he basically lays it out. I think we're going to be looking at less science, bigger grants, fewer of them, unless we can convince the federal government to substantially increase spending. Uh, and that's, a, as you know, a challenge. So um, this is um, something we're going to have to address. I'll come back to uh, kind of implications at the end. I think a pos uh, an unfortunate thing, but also a positive trend, uh, unfortunate that this needs to be true, but positive that it is, is wider and deeper recognition of income and race inequality is a serious problem. This is really important within universities that we have deeper and deeper understanding of racial 
uh, and income inequality in the United States and what we need to do to change it. Because within higher ed, many of the changes that need to happen are going to directly and positively impact our diversity, equity, and inclusion goals. But they do require change by faculty who control the power through uh, the shared governance process. And it has been slow, candidly, to get universities in many cases to make the kinds of adjustments and changes that need to happen to be more welcoming uh, for students of diverse backgrounds. So what occurred uh, in the wake of George Floyd uh, was a significant thing in my observation in convincing many faculty to begin across every discipline to begin paying more significant attention to what needs to be done to address in a, in a significant way DEI goals. And this was something that was still prior to that period. We didn't have as many, I can tell you at Oregon State, as many of faculty across every discipline reading and thinking deeply about this. We recently revised our general education curriculum in a very significant way. We got that through because of the widespread recognition of the faculty that if we didn't make it easier for transfer students, many of whom were students of color and of limited means, it was going to be difficult for students to attend Oregon State. And a lot of folks gave up a lot of territory in their disciplines in order to make that possible that traditionally they would have fought over. So that is a positive and I think something that we should continue to push uh, forward on in higher ed. Public distrust of higher education is, you know, as you know, we'll talk a little bit more at the end about this. Um, it's it's a, an all-time high. Some of this is cultural perception that we're not uh, true defenders of freedom and inquiry and speech. Some of the, what's happened, you know, this recent event at Stanford with law students shouting down uh, the uh, uh, appeals judge. That, that's an embarrassment for us in higher education. And if you, if you haven't had as a department head or dean a chance to um, really study issues around uh, freedom of inquiry and speech, I encourage you to do so. One of these days it's coming to your doorstep and you'll want to be prepared. And a good place to start is Dean Jenny Martinez's 10-page response to that situation at Stanford. She writes an eloquent response that's worth reading. You can find it on the web. Distress to public of the uh, distress to the public of the economics of higher education is growing and I think it's you know, you understand how many years did we spend trying to convince families that if you want to be successful in the United States, you need to get a college degree. All of us use that narrative. Here are all the reasons why you should pursue a college degree. Here are the economic returns you will gain. Here are the social networking advantages of having that college degree. We know those are real. But think about if you're a family who cannot afford it, or you perceive you cannot afford it which is another uh, aspect of the problem. They have a real and perceived inability to meet the cost. It varies significantly by race, ethnicity, uh, in terms of their readiness and their willingness to, to assume debt, which is one of our primary funding vehicles. And it's driving anger and frustration because universities are seen as the gatekeeper. You're too expensive, but I can't succeed without it. So it should not surprise us that the significant share of the American population does not see us as the good guys in this narrative. And I think that is uh, what is part, uh, you know, in large measure part, uh, responsible for our reputation, probably more so in my view than cultural. Um, and it's deliberately aided and abetted by state officials uh, who have used universities as the balance wheel in their budget. And I don't know how many state meetings I've been at in Illinois, in North Carolina, in Oregon, where I've heard state officials talk about and use universities as an example of profligate spending and waste, even as they cut the budget every year, forcing tuition to rise. Now, we do have a cost problem in higher education, but the principal problem is we've dialed out of funding our institutions in many of our states. And then that has become political uh, capital for a certain segment of the elected population, by the way, on both the left and the right. So in Oregon, you probably know Oregon, it's pretty left, especially in the Willamette Valley and where all the political power base is, not so much on the east side of the state. But within the political power class in Oregon, you'll hear mostly about how universities are elite and wasteful, which is laughable if you know anything about Oregon's universities, they're nothing but they're the furthest thing from elite as a traditional uh, understanding of what elite is. Um, 
But the, the assumption in the legislature and a lot of political capital is gained by describing the universities as wasteful and the community colleges as the, the solution. The community colleges are part of the solution, but that scapegoating is self-interested and it's not helping our reputation. There are some positive stories here, though, and my overall view of higher ed is bullish. You may not be gathering that from my comments so far. So let me uh, see if I can raise the uh, optimism for you, just touch. Um, you know, uh, a lot of people talk about a digital and, and uh, global transformation of the economy. I, a lot of it, we've been talking about it for years. I think it is real uh, and accelerating. Um, the implications are becoming more visible. Uh, particularly in the wake of the pandemic. The core drivers of wealth, and this is good for us, they're not analog, they're not national, and they're not industrial. They're global and they're digital. Uh, and they're going to be knowledge-based. We are entering a global economic uh, period in which we will need worldwide the most educated population in human history. There's no question in my mind about that. It is truly an information economy that is going to drive prosperity and it's going to drive a lot of the solutions to challenges we face. The challenging part is that the traditional ways we try to influence that, those are weakening. So some of the national policy um, uh, influences. And if you, I know for a lot of planners, you. Uh, study a lot about green energy. Um, if you read about the emergence, for example, of the solar and wind energy sectors and study that literature, what you see is the uh, pretty clever way by which those sectors have emerged in a very globalized, digitally uh, driven world, even as the states, the nations, tried to capture that activity and hold it in their, within their borders. Honestly, companies are working on a global scale, whether or not our folks in Washington want that to be the case. This is true in those industries, it's true in semiconductors, it's true in other sectors. So we have to, I think, as universities, adapt to that world order. The last um, kind of external factor I want to mention is maybe one that's more hopeful, because I'm a city planner, but I think might, might have some legs, and that is, I think there is a recovery of understanding, in, among, at least among national officials, uh, of the importance of recovering places and communities as essential to the long-run prosperity in this country. Uh, you know, again, maybe a little hopeful on my part, but sometimes, since I spend a lot of time on economics, uh, when I see traditional economists who formally would argue you should not worry about places at all, that it's inefficient, let people move around and adjust, even as I, as a young faculty member at UNC Chapel Hill, was watching multiple towns across that state be decimated by the outmigration of textiles, furniture, apparel manufacturing. Those are the very hotbeds of the opioid crisis today, uh, those cities and towns that were decimated by that industrial change. And economists' view at that time was those will adjust. They haven't adjusted. And many, many cities across the United States, many regions, many rural areas, many of, hot, of the hotbeds of political con discontent are these communities that were left behind in this global economy. And I think what you're seeing from the Biden administration is an attempt to recognize that in some of the policies that it's recently passed. Now, the Biden administration is only going to last so long, but what gives me a little bit of hope here is those same very, very same economists, in some cases, Larry Summers is a good example, are now talking about how important places are. And previously, uh, the narrative was, well, places shouldn't, it's inefficient to worry about places. So maybe we've wised up a little bit in this regard, and I think there's some um, opportunity here for city planning programs. So let me mention one internal factor um, that I think is relevant for thinking about higher ed too, and that is how many of you uh, have experienced an occasion where you felt like you had the responsibility to solve a problem in your institution, or maybe you saw an opportunity to solve a problem, but you didn't have the authority or the control to actually do it? Raise your hand if, that, if you've ever had that experience. Yeah, see, that gets a bigger laugh. It's more like nervous laughter, though, right? Um, this is, in my view, our fundamental problem in universities today, is the disconnect between where the responsibility sits and where the control and authority sit. And this is true all at all levels of the institution. 
and it's true beyond the institution as well. Uh, we're seeing at Oregon State in lots of ways in which leaders are in a position or put in a position to try to solve a problem that our organization is not actually structured to solve. Um, it's a normal problem if you think in the long run because typically economic, economic technological changes, all those things out there that I've just talked about, they happen much faster than institutional change. So what we're seeing inside the university is a lagging effect of our institutional structure and the way we do business with the way um, students are interacting with us, more and more younger faculty are interacting with us, and so on. But it's a problem that we're going to need to solve through a lot of deliberate, as I mentioned earlier, leadership, deliberate efforts to innovate within the institution. So let me talk about a few implications and then I'll, I'll stop. So um, students are going to be in control, uh, I think. Um, they, uh, our control as institutions is decreasing. The proliferation of digital devices, media, students are going to want round the clock, you're seeing this I'm sure, post-pandemic, highly flexible, uh, round the clock access over fixed access in places that we define. This is increasingly going, our ability to control, now a few universities, the, the most highest ranked among us probably can get away with this, but for most of us, especially where city planning programs tend to be, big state institutions, uh, our students are going to be in the driver's seat in terms of where and how they want to learn. And this is only going to get stronger, I think, over time. You saw it in the newspaper business. Newspapers, print newspapers. Here, we're going to give you it in this format. And now it's a completely unbundled uh, free-for-all in terms of where people get information. And I think that kind of, uh, that kind of force is, is facing us in higher ed. The focus is going to be on learning not on teaching for certain lengths of time. I think we're gonna see the proliferation of competency over credit hours as a currency. It's something we could think creatively about in this field. And we need to think about what we want students to achieve and get them there, not think about how long they need to take to do it. And so the notion that we should be counting credit hours and figuring out how do we fill a two-year program with credit hours is not the way we should be thinking about delivering a quality master of planning degree, for example. Uh, and, you know, we may feel we know best as educators, but the control is increasingly out of our hands. I think higher education is going to increasingly drive economic change, not just respond to it. This is the positive part for higher ed, and it's kind of the ironic part, too, because at the time when we're feeling really beleaguered as institutions in our society and many of our states and so on, is actually a time when we have enormous influence on where the economy is going to go, where scientific innovation is going to land, where many of the solutions that need to be addressed, most important among them, climate change, universities are going to be the key drivers. This is because the information economy is going to be driven by minds. And we produce and support the folks, the knowledge, and the, the skills out there that are going to be needed. Um, so as I mentioned, we're entering a world where we're going to need the most educated population in history. So uh, that's a good position for universities, So despite our current reputation. What this says to me is that universities need a really clear vision of their role. In, economy, in the economy and society. They need to articulate what that vision is. They need to explain how you get to prosperous, sustainable communities that are equitable. And they need to build that into their institutional strategy. This needs to be more than the city planning program talking about this. This needs to be the university talking about it in the context of their state, in the context of the federal landscape. And I don't see that happening across higher education as much as it's going to need to happen. But it's the key, I think, to our ultimate success as institutions. We need a true commitment to access and affordability. That means many of us are going to have to do things differently than we did them before, enabled with digital technology when it makes sense. I think we're going to need to invest a lot more in cognitive science, in learning science, our faculty, every one of our teaching faculty should know something about the field of learning science and where it is on the frontier. 
This is the privileging of learning over teaching. Uh, and that's going to need to be a priority for us. We need to rebalance research and teaching. This is going to be one of the hardest conversations. I like to tell people, do you know when Harvard developed its reputation that the teaching load was six courses a year? Most people can't imagine, how could I teach five courses a year? How could I teach four in some of our institutions? We have departments at OSU, they teach once a year. Can't possibly imagine. But if you look at the trajectory of higher ed when it really built big, elite, high-impact institutions, teaching loads were much heavier than they are today. This isn't to say we should burden all of our faculty with teaching, but the reality is we're going to have difficulty, as I mentioned before, sustaining the same research-driven model, which right now is riding more and more on the backs of tuition, uh, as we have in the past. And, if, and it's my belief that if we actually rebalance those loads, even moderately, we would be much better off as institutions and continue to drive our research forward. We have to get out of the quantity game and focus on the quality and impact of the research we're doing. That's a really, really, really hard conversation. I just had a meeting with all our department heads at OSU. We were talking about our upcoming graduate student contracts, some of the things that you see, and they all nodded. Okay, provost, blah, 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 we understand, we understand. And at the end, it was like, but don't you realize graduate students are really important to our identity? <laughs> that was the last. So what, however you figure this out, just make sure we have the same number of graduate students as we had before. That's not going to do it. We're going to have to figure out how we drive the research enterprise with the uh, funds we have. Um, let me finish with just a comment about polarization. So this is, a, this is a huge issue in Oregon. It's like a poster child for it. Uh, if you're on the west side of the Cascades, you have one set of conversations. If you're on the east side of the Cascades, you have another set of conversations. Um, the conversations are heated and extreme. Um, in my view, we need to learn how to get in those conversations by not talking at people, but talking with them using terminology and language that makes sense to them. We need to stop imagining that they care about our analysis, because they don't. And we should imagine what they do care about is making change that matters to their communities, and we need to get on with it. And a real tangible example of that was some communication we had out of our extension office at one point a year or so ago, out across the state of Oregon, with, I think, you know, for you and me in this room, some very nice messaging around the importance of tackling systemic racism. Received on the eastern side of the state, uh, you can imagine how it was received, because nobody understood the terms, and as a consequence, we became uh, enmeshed in a debate about language, instead of a debate about what changes need to happen in order to ensure that everyone has access to education, that we're a truly inclusive society, that we are truly uh, fighting discrimination everywhere it, where it uh, exists. And we need to get away from that battle and recognize that folks are a lot less interested in our analysis than they are in our solutions. So that's my, my thoughts on that one. It's not going to be an easy debate. We, um, we're going to start some open debates on right and left at OSU soon. And uh, I'm interested to see how it'll go. Uh, it'll probably be painful. Because I think all of you know it's a lot easier to have conversations on the left and moderate side of the political spectrum in our institutions than it is on the right. That's just a fact. And so how do we deal with that? We start setting these conversations up and show students and faculty how to have a productive dialogue across that divide. It's going to take a lot of courage. Uh, all right, thank you very much for the award. I'm really proud to have it. And thanks for letting me blather on at you for at length today. Thank you. Uh, thank you for what uh, uh, you said in your presentation. Uh, uh, I'm, I've been chair for, it's my fifth year as chair at Alabama University. 
So you mentioned here uh, that chair need to have outside in, right? So now my question to you is, uh, you are as a planner, and now you are provost. So what you expect from your chair as a, in, 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 in the planning department to, to, to apply that mindset outside in? What's the first steps that you expect from, from those chairs? Yeah, um, I guess I'll just answer that one uh, rather than take a couple, but um, really quickly put yourself in the shoes of your dean. Right, that's step one. Um, and put yourself, put yourself in your shoes of your provost. How are they thinking? I will tell you this, I've said it to various settings at ACSP. I'm astonished how infrequently I get a good proposal for an investment from a unit that wants to directly address a challenge that I know exists and they know exists. I'll use an enrollment challenge where we know there needs to be significant renovation of the curriculum to be responsive to student demand, and it's hard. It's hard because faculty don't want to spend time on it. I get it, but it needs to happen. Maybe they don't have the resources, but if a unit brings me a proposal as a provost that says, okay, I understand the university is facing this challenge financially. It's changing the, facing this challenge in enrollment. You have challenges all across the campus. I'm going to be part of the solution. Here's how this unit can do it. Almost never do I turn those proposals down. If they're tangible and they have outcomes and predicted results that we can measure results to, those are worth investing in. Provosts aren't sitting around trying to husband their cash. They don't have any cash. Every provost is robbing Peter to pay Paul. And you're robbing Peter who's not doing what he should be doing to give it to Paul, who is. <laughs> so I think, the, um, I think when I say outside in, think from the perspective of the levels that are trying to tackle the overall uh, problems, whether at a college or the university, and situate what you do as a unit within that. And one thing I never did as a department head, didn't do it as a dean, is decide that the problem was someone else's. If you start there, they just need to give us more money. They just need to give us more positions. They just need to give us more scholarship dollars. You're already off on the wrong foot. That will, you might get a little bit out of that. You're not going to build the fundamental strength of your program that way. So that's kind of what I mean by outside in. Yeah. Hi, thanks for an interesting talk. Um, I just wanted to sort of follow up on a, um, a statement you made about the demand by students for non-traditional forms of education, non-synchronous, perhaps, uh, and just offer a comment, which is that our experience has at, at uh, UC Berkeley has been that students were overjoyed to be back in the classroom after the, after the pandemic, and that there's a real value that they perceive in spending time with each other, um, being in the classroom to see each other face to face, having those in-person interactions and so on. And so I just wanted to have you, you know, speak a little bit more to that, to that point, because I can imagine that in many contexts, and I, I, I suppose these contexts will vary, but in many contexts you can expect that students are going to be seeking out in-person experiences, perhaps more than ever in certain ways. So. Yeah, Thanks. absolutely. I, I completely agree with you. We saw the same thing at Oregon State. What I would ask us to be mindful of is the, the distribution of capacity to, um, to enjoy that model is, is very uneven. Um, and so at, uh, at Oregon State, for example, we, we have a large number of students who are working two, three jobs. Uh, in order to attend the university. Uh, we, we don't have enough financial aid, we don't have enough state support to close the need gap for those students. So you're going to see differences across institutions, um, and they should be differences. What I would ask us all to do, wh wherever you are, whether you're at a well-resourced university, uh, a less well-resourced one, is look for those pain points where you can actually meet students where they are a little bit better. Um, especially for students of limited means that, um, that may struggle under that traditional model. You, you, won't get me to, you won't convince me that online is the best model. Um, 
but I have become convinced that if we're re truly going to increase access, that we have to take seriously getting that access into the hands of more people. And I think this will be the last question. Okay. Hi there, Tara Clapp, University of Northern British Columbia. And I'm just thinking about institutional lag and good ideas. And I want to mix in competency-based learning um, versus student credit hours. So I can imagine, like I'm, I, I'd be, I'm very excited about, you know, remote community access to learning through a competency-based model. And then the other side, in British Columbia, we have like the, the DQAB, Degree Quality Assurance, and it's a lot of counting student credit hours. And actually like limitations on, you know, chair's ability to credit prior learning. So have you seen some, like, I've been on the student learning outcomes train for a long time. Have you seen some models where universities have, where an existing institution has, has like moved more towards a competency-based model than an SCH model? Yeah, not in a significant way, uh, outside of a couple of online, strictly online providers. Um, I think, you know, there may be some, I'm not an expert in this area, but um, this is uh, a much more active conversation among more institutions, more diverse institutions, probably just over the last 24 months than it has been before. So I'm, I'm hopeful we'll actually make some progress on that. We have all kinds of accreditation and state regulation and other things that we have to fight through to get um, greater uh, flexibility to consider competency-based learning. I think it could be extremely valuable for fields like this one to uh, have some additional capacity to take advantage of competency-based learning. So I'm, I hope it will develop these ideas. You know, you could take a, somebody who's been in the military for five years in the Army Corps of Engineers or something, and the amount of expertise they're bringing into programs that we're then putting them through basic classes, it does not make any sense. And it doesn't make any sense when you think about inclusion and accessibility to a broader cross-section of the American population to higher education. So we need to stop that. And I think this is one possible route to it, but still in its nascent form. Thank you. Thank you.